All right. So my name is Aaron Yarmel, and I'm joined uh, here today with by uh, Roger Yates and Ronnie Lee. I'm thrilled to have both of them back. So Roger is a sociologist, and he's the founder of the Vegan Information Project. Um, he was also the former press officer of the Animal Liberation Front. And <clears throat> I'm really thrilled to have him back because I've, I've learned a whole lot from Roger about like the early history of the vegan movement. And um, He's one of the you know best people I think to listen to if you really want to get a good understanding of of what was going on you know in the founding of the movement and get a really good picture of that. And uh, Ronnie, of course, is one of the co-founders of the Animal Liberation Front, as we saw in the last interview. And it's a real thrill to have have Ronnie back because I um you know in, in the last interview it was really cool to get sort of like a an, an in depth intimate picture of what it was like to be in the room where the Animal Liberation Front was formed and just to sort of hear hear about that and to hear how he evolved as an activist and to somebody who today does primarily uh, vegan street outreach. So welcome to both of you and thanks so much for being on the show. Thanks, Thank Aaron. you. Good to be back. Yes, it's great. Yeah. Um, good, to see, good to see you, Ronnie. Somebody told me you were dead, mate. Uh, I was, but I came back to life. Oh, I just for this interview. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> That's good. Well, I'm, I'm glad you're I'm glad you're alive too. Now. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So why don't we start with a question that I think a lot of people are initially going to not understand why it's a tricky question, but I think they'll see once we answer it why it is. So I'm going to ask both of you, what is veganism? When we use the word veganism, what do we actually mean and what should we mean? Um, why don't we start with Roger? Well, veganism is a radical philosophy. It's about justice and nonviolence. And I think the founders of the movement saw themselves as part of the peace movement on the grounds that they formed the movement uh, during the latter part of World War II. You know, so they saw themselves as a kind of radical um, kind of peace thing in the sense that um, if you look at their writing, they're clearly trying to find out what went wrong with humanity. And they thought that we'd gone to some kind of level of barbarism that they'd just um, seen the Third Reich and they'd seen the effect of it. I was reading today, actually, about Donald Watson, and um, he, he's, he reckons he was almost killed during the Second World War because there was a raid on Leicester, but the, the Luftwaffe, they um, bombed Coventry instead. So, you know, so they were in the thick of it, really, and so they were trying to work out what had gone wrong with humanity. And their conclusion was that we needed to evolved morally and veganism was part of that yeah and just to follow up on that for a second one thing that sometimes people say when they're talking about donald watson is, is they'll go back to what they say is the vegan society's definition of veganism and the way that it's framed is that it's it's something about of you know avoiding as much as practical and possible you know the exploitation and, and use of animals but, I, yeah. but when I hear you talking about, you know, the early founders and how they thought of veganism, it's a much more expansive thing. Um, so, so what's going on with uh, that? Um, it's just the fact that people are making a common mistake. And um, a lot of people uh, don't know the history, as we've kind of alluded to before. Um, you know, to be frank, there's a lot of people in the movement whose um, veganism begins with Gary Yorosky. And, you know, so they've got a very distorted view about what it's all about. Uh, I was talking to um, the co-founder of a very well-known group uh, recently on Instagram, and she was saying that, uh, you know, vegan has got nothing to do with humans and neither has animal rights. And so when I pointed out what the founders meant and uh, by veganism and what Tom Reagan thought about animal rights, uh, she just dismissed it, you know, and called me arrogant for, for saying what was, as, as it were, true and on, on the record. So there is a kind of rewriting going on. There are some people who are trying to reduce veganism to a diet. And there are a lot of activists who want it to be other animals only. Whereas my position is that's the focus, but not the scope. Got it. And Dick, can you talk a little bit about the vegan society definition that people point mm. to? Yeah, well, again, on that conversation, um, the person was saying, well, I'm quoting the 1944 definition uh, by Donald Watson. And I said, well, that's interesting on the grounds that there isn't one. Um, you know, Donald Watson wasn't uh, so great a, a, about coming up with a formal um, comprehensive uh, definition. And in fact, it was Leslie Cross a few years later who pointed out to everybody, I think it's about 1949, 50, 
saying we don't really have a very good working definition. Although going back to 1945, Donald Watson did say that um, the object of the vegan society was to oppose all all exploitation of sentient life, whether it was profitable to do so or not. So there's always these things, you know, a lot of people um, are trying to superimpose the, the vegan society definition onto Donald Watson. And that's a wrong thing to do because the vegan society definition that we all know, and of course, Ronnie famously has, has updated it a little bit, but the one that we all know from 1979 is fairly weak. And it really just focuses on, on the focus of veganism and not scope. And so I, I did a, um, a film uh, you know, a few months ago now saying that the definition that we're working with is not the best one, unfortunately, the more radical ones from the previous time. Cool. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, and then let's start over to Ronnie. So um, same sort of question, you know, what is veganism? How should we be using the word veganism? Well, I think it's how, uh, where we're going to take the, the meaning of that from. Are we going to take it from um, when the vegan society was first formed and um, stick with that? Because I understand the de- definition of vegan societies definition of veganism has, has actually been updated several times through the year so i think the, the one at the moment goes back quite some while but it has been updated a few times so so kind of which is the one that we follow is it the the first one we can find or is it the updated one or or what it's um it's kind of it's kind of very difficult really and and i think it's led to lots of people having their own um definition of veganism or what veganism should be i mean there's one group that wants veganism to only cover um plant-based diet that all it is a vegan is just a person that eats a plant diet and that's it it doesn't cover anything else and and there is a group actually campaigning for that and then you get uh, you get the other end of the scale where uh, people want to extend the, the definition of veganism and for instance um the vegan flag definition which um probably was coined about um 18 months or so ago um by a friend of mine tony harris and i gave him a hand with that um kind of extends the, the definition in two ways first of all it, it, it includes an environmental aspect to it in, in terms of that veganism should also cover harm to the habitats of animals because that's another way that animals are oppressed by humans and secondly uh, it says that veganism shouldn't be just a passive thing shouldn't be about what people don't do but should be about what they do do in terms of people um that that true vegans should promote veganism so that's that's a kind of you know that's that's an updated definition that's obviously more popular with people that are more active so is it it, it, is the definition something that is evolving all the time or is is it something that we go back to the past to find try and find what the original definition was and that's um that's a kind of that's a kind of difficult one I, I mean i tend to to what extent that concerns me i'm not sure I'm, i mean primarily i describe myself as an animal liberationist rather than a vegan and i'd kind of like vegan veganism to mean animal liberation i'd like them to mean the same thing and i think with some people who do and some people they don't yeah that's really interesting so so we get like i mean there's a couple of threads in there one of them is this idea of how should we pick our definitions is the best way to go back and to say let's go with the original meaning of the term or or should be should what we're doing be to say um you know let's look how the definition's evolving and figure out what's the best way of using it today to serve our our particular kinds of um interests or what we're trying to do in the movement um and i think that 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 is an interesting tension um what well, i hear i'm cool with that you know in the sense that um you know social movements move that's one of, one of the defining features of the fact they move so they evolve their ideas evolve and uh, their concepts evolve so there's nothing wrong with that it's just that usually what they do is they evolve with reference to what was before and that's the thing that's not not happening right now People, as you say, are coming up with their own versions of it with no reference to what the pioneers uh, felt. You know? And I, w- whether the, the pioneers' view of things masses is debatable. I tend to think that they do uh, on the grounds that I, 
I think that veganism is a radical idea, and so did they. So you know that it kind of marries with with with, 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 what, with what I want in a way. Going back to what Ronnie said about um, the environment, they did see themselves as the ecologists. You know, Eva Bat from 1964, she talked about how veganism was about opposing the exploitation of humans, other animals, and also she used an interesting phrase. She said the exploitation of the soil. And, you know, quite a few of them, because they were kind of gardeners as well. I mean, they came out of the Second World War. They were still rationing and everything. They were very concerned about the soil quality. You know, and that, and that issue came back into the movement in the 1980s with a, a book called A Diet for a New America by John Robbins. You know, so, um, yeah, so ideas do evolve and that's fine. And so, so long as, you know, if people want to have a debate, then we can say, well, you know, we can cherry pick if you like, but at least know the different versions and then we can talk about it. Whereas what we've got now is just a series of assertions. It's not based on knowledge. Yeah. I mean, there's a couple of powerful critiques in there. So like Paul Bashir is the, I think he's the he's founder and person who directs um, Anonymous to the Voiceless. He had a Facebook post a couple of, I think it was like two weeks ago, where he said, vegan is and always has been just about animals and people who want to link it to things like the environment are just like, you know, sort of getting the message wrong. And that's just factually incorrect. It's like, if you want to change the definition and make an argument for that and say why we ought to define it this way rather than this way, nobody's mm -hmm. against that. But no. we need to be historically accurate. We need to be able yeah, to, but, if we're going to make like claims say, about no, history. No, nobody's against it. The same as, I mean, the, the example I use is that we've now got neo-Marxism. But mm -hmm. all the neo-Marx, neo-Marx and critical theorists back at school, they all knew what Marx uh, said was Marxism, or at least what Marx's position was, right? What we've got here is we've got people making assertions without knowing what they're talking about, essentially. And, yeah. and that is just, um, well, it's a bit silly, but it's also wrong because they've got a, a large following and these people are just taking their word for it, as it were. You know? And when I, when I kind of go up on social media and I go, well, actually, that's not wrong. That's not right. You know, I, I get kind of shut down. You know, they, people have said things like, F the founders. You know, it doesn't yeah. matter, I think. Um, and I found that unacceptable because we can have a conversation, but at least we should do it based on, you know, what is, and, you know, on, on knowledge of the same. Yeah. And excellent. So I want, I want to throw it back to Ronnie for just a second. So one thing you mentioned, Roger, is that Ronnie has um, had critiques of the sort of definition of veganism that is often attributed to the vegan society today. Um, did, did, did I catch that correctly? Um, I, I mean, I was involved in a, in in a, in helping with an updated okay um, cool. definition of veganism, which I think is better. I I, I think there's probably an even better one than that to be <laughs> um, as well. But you see, I kind of look at it from the point of view of I'm an animal liberationist. I want animal liberation, right? right. So, for the purposes of achieving that. It'd be great if people thought that veganism equaled animal liberation, because then that makes animal liberation easier to achieve. So I, I, I you know, kind of my my sort of thrust, my effort is to is to try to get people to see veganism as equivalent with animal liberation. Hmm. I see. The, the no, thing is about that, Ronnie, is that um, that's exactly what some of the pioneers thought. Leslie Cross, for example, hmm. is quoted yeah. by saying veganism is about liberation; it's not about welfare. You know, they, they actually spoke in those terms. So, you know, that, that's not an issue. Um, I think that some of the confusion goes back to something that DXE said when they, when they put out their famous boycott veganism pamphlet. And then people like Earthling Ed followed it, which is the idea that, you know, somebody's kicking a dog, you know, you can, you can either join in or you can stand back and refuse to join in or you can do something about it. And what they say is that veganism is number two, but there's nothing about, any of the definition of veganism that, that says that you can't intervene. So the idea that it, it bars activism is wrong in the first place. Mm. And, and the kicking the dog, you see, I don't think the kicking the dog analogy is kind of entirely accurate um, because we're kind of not in the situation where one person is kicking the dog. 
we're in a situation where people are kicking dogs all over the place massively and and dealing with that is 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 rather different than dealing with the 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 one person that's kicking a dog if you see what i mean because the equivalent of like of intervening stop the one person kicking a dog um in terms of veganism for instance would be to go into a slaughterhouse and, and to try and stop somebody putting the, the bolt gun up to the head of a cow or or sitting a chicken's throat or whatever and that kind of in in broad terms that actually isn't really the best way to tackle it the best way to tackle it is to educate in people not to um pay for that sort of thing in the first place isn't it so it's not the the, the, the kicking the dog um analogy i don't think is 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 accurate in terms of what we need to do that's interesting. I mean, I, I think, uh, so I want to make sure I understand, I understand the critique. It's like, if I see somebody kicking a dog right in front of me, I can just yeah. run in there and stop them from kicking the dog. But if we have a massive social structure designed to make people do this and make them not think yeah. about it and just sort of, you know, create all these ways of thinking that entrench dog kicking and keep it even behind closed doors sometimes, um, I need a different set of uh, tactics. Is that, is that sort of the, that's the thrust of the critique? Yeah, well, I'd, I'd say that. I mean, we can, we can, it's always useful to make human rights analogies here. So if we were to see an individual human being attacked by someone else, mm -hmm. we would probably feel the impulse to intervene, uh, at least to shout and try and get support from other people. If there was everybody attacking the person and that, and that was also a socially sanctioned thing to do, then we would be in a different ball game. That's, I think, what Swan is getting at. Okay, that makes mm -hmm. sense. Yeah, yeah. 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 Cool. And one, I think one thing that, that I think is important to talk about is like, is it like, should we be pointing to the founders? Like, should we be going back to the earlier definition? And um, I, I want to give one consideration, I think, that really points to the power of that sort of tactic. And it comes from the analytical Marxists. So there's, there's um, do you know the work of, uh, what's his name, Craig, Cal Craig Calhoun? Yeah, I do a little um, bit, yeah. Yeah, so he has this paper about... Um, some, it's, it's, it's something to the effect that most revolutionary movements are in some sense reactionary in the sense that what you're doing is, is, is you're defending an old way of life. What you're doing is you're saying, let's, let's look back to our roots and let's see that we have something that is worth protecting and worth fighting for that is beautiful and good and true and it's under attack and we need to uh, mobilize to defend that. And there's something that's incredibly beautiful about a group of people as you said last time, declaring peace in the middle of the Second World War. And when we say something like, you know, we're going to defend the definition that the original vegan founders had, we are defending something beautiful and, and amazing about, you know, about our history and about our, our heritage as like vegan activists that we're just not getting if we just every day have a new definition. Um, so I think that there is something powerful from the perspective of trying to build a movement that I think should push us in favor of at least, you know, considering defending the, the original definition. And given that it's so radical, given that it has so much power to, you know, bring us to a new place in the movement where we're fighting for this, you know, overall liberation, I think that that might push us even farther. And we're not really losing anything important if, if we take that important definition. Yeah, well, I'd agree with that because, you know, it, well, it's true. You know, I mean, obviously, what the founders say is not law. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's not set in concrete. That's the, that's the important part there. At the same time, it shouldn't be ignored because it's part of the mix and it is part of our heritage. And as you say, they were revolutionary. It was a radical thing. They, they didn't sound revolutionary. They didn't speak in sound bites. And I think that's one of the kind of problems in a way. Uh, because, you know, they were, I, I tend to say in, in my talks, they were gentle English folk. And, um, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, I think it also important to make clear that, you know, people talked about veganism or what was called veganism for many, many years and centuries before the social movement. So when I talk about it, I'm talking about it as a social movement. And that did have its origins in 1944 in England. So that's what, that's, that's what I'm, I'm doing about it. And so, you know, obviously... There's the vegan society. I suppose you could say the Bushy's vegan society. It's mm -hmm. going to be accurate, but it's known as the vegan society, right? So there is no nuance of this way. Excellent. That's helpful. Cool. And then, um, so, so Ronnie, I want to go back to one thing that you said a few minutes ago. So there's this, 
what what you're saying was that you want veganism to mean animal liberation. And I I I want it too. But what I wonder is it seems like there's a trade-off between getting more people to comply with uh less stringent conditions and getting fewer people to comply with more stringent conditions. And in the social movements literature we can talk about um groups having mass orientations or insular orientations. And I think that that's part of the trade-off that you're you're running into when you're you know coming up with a new definition. You're helping the vegan society come up with a new definition. And I'm just wondering, like, if you have any advice for thinking through that, like, like how should we balance um, the desire to have more people, you know, following or to have more, uh, like, you know, rigorous, powerful uh, messages, or do we even need to trade them off? I, I'm kind of not sure we need to. I mean, the. the um Basic thing, I think the, the the problem we have is speciesism, is human supremacism, and this is this is the basic reason why other animals are oppressed and exploited in in the first place. And and we kind of we need to challenge that. Um, and educating to, to people to go vegan in terms of not just a, a, of a diet, but that people um, accept that. that. I see. Um, I think. Yeah, it's it's breaking up just a, just for a minute to, to oppress other animals. That's 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 what we that's what we need to do. That's what we need to that's what we need to push, and to um, get as. I think the um, so I'm not here. I think it, it froze on on your end, Ronnie. Yeah, it looks like it. Okay, well, I'm sure he'll be back in a minute. Um, do you want so and and Roger, like you've talked about this a little bit also. Like in the last conversation we had, you mentioned how when you push for rights, you get welfare. Anyways, yes. Um, but do you think that there's any place where this kind of trade-off is at, at all useful to be thinking about or, or compelling? Well, possibly, but you just don't have to call it veganism when it's not. I mean, yeah. that's the, the thing. You know, I, I, um, you know, I, I get um, a little bit tired of the fact that we might have what you might call vegetarians, we might have vegetarians, and we might have vegans, and the vegetarians and vegetarians are forever wanting. As vegans to do their work, and my my view is well, if you want to push vegetarianism, if you want to push vegetarianism, then you do that and leave us vegans to do veganism because there's less of us in the first place. You know, I think, um, and I probably made this point last time. I think they recognise that we are the activists of those three groups, and so they're wanting people to represent the position, and they realise that you know the vegetarians and the vegetarians are not really campaigners, whereas the vegans are. You know, I think that's kind of part of the deal, why they're kind of trying to kind of co-opt us to do it. It's very much the same with rights and welfare. You know, when, when people call for unity in the movement, it usually means the animal welfareists are asking the animal rights people to do animal welfare because they won't do animal rights. Okay, so there's that kind of trade-off. I and, mean, you know, movement unity sounds great, obviously. It's just that that's what it means. And so that's why there's a, you know, there's a kind of problem with it. Yeah, I I love that. Um, Ronnie, did you? Sorry, do you, you? I think there was a connection issue. Do you want to keep keep going? You were talking a little bit about um, the question of uh, whether we ever need to make these trade offs between like mass and insular orientations and vegan definitions. Oh, sorry. I've been. I, I, mean, I lost the signal for a while there, <laughs> um, and I don't really know what happened. I uh, I think Roger. I think you picked up, didn't you, from where I kind of stopped? Is that right? Yeah, I bailed you out, Ronnie. <laughs> yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> I don't know. I think that there may be, for some reason, and and not a good signal here today. It seems to be, it seems to be dropping every so often, and I kind of it it sort of reboots, and then am I am I on the side, or can you still see me properly? Um, right now it looks like you're uh, you're sideways, but I'm sure that yeah, it'll fix itself. You're, you're kind of both sideways to me online and it may may correct itself eventually hopefully um but i don't know what's i mean no so i don't know what's happening tonight unless someone is trying to knows about this and they're trying to sabotage me of course um maybe yeah <laughs> this could be the case um yeah I, I mean i think it's um it kind of it is it is frustrating when you get um you kind of get the wrongful definition of the word vegan when when people are using vegan to um 
just describe the diet. And I think this is there is a problem with the word vegan in that it describes um, both the diet and a philosophy. Um, for instance, vegan food is 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 basically plant food, um, but that kind of definition is 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 kind of used to to describe um, people that consume a plant diet even though that for instance if some if 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 someone is um says i'm vegan for the environment then technically that person isn't vegan because you're only vegan if you're (laughs) if you're vegan for the purposes of um being opposed to animal exploitation if you're vegan for health reasons you're not vegan because that isn't to do with being opposed to animal exploitation and, and what people are really saying is it is not that they're vegan but they're but they're plant-based so they consume a plant diet for those for those reasons but they're not actually technically vegan because the philosophy of veganism is a philosophy that's opposed to the exploitation of other animals and i think there's a problem with uh, um the kind of um you've got one word being used for two different things and and that causes difficulties yeah, that makes sense. So it's like we should, um, I want to try to integrate that with something that, that Roger said, because I think they're, they're supporting similar their points. There's this idea that there, we need to have a broader term that refers to a diet and plant-based seems like it does a fine job of that. Um, there's no need to make, to turn veganism into that because it's, it's misleading and not only misleading, but it becomes weaponized by people who want to moderate the movement. Um, you know calls for unity we've always, got, we've always got to be wary of that the moderate the moderators but i mean really we're talking about language now and precision of language helps you know because um building on what ronnie just said in in a way you know um there is no vegan food there there are no vegan cats and dogs and there are no vegan human infants you know veganism means adhering to a philosophy there is a uh, I was in a conversation recently when somebody was arguing that people are born vegan. And I said, no, no one is born vegan. That's the same as saying someone is born as a Marxist. Mm-hmm. You know, so you, you've got to adhere to a philosophy to be vegan. You know, whether, whether you're talking about, well, you're born not eating flesh and dairy and all that kind of stuff, that's a different thing. But to say we're born, so we're not very precise with our language sometimes. And, you know, social media is not that useful in, the, in those terms, but perhaps. But um, so there is a language issue. You know, I, I, I would kind of concede that. If you like. um, and maybe if we were a bit more precise, Sandra Higgins uh, of Go Vegan World, she uses the phrase that Ronnie used before, plant diet. Mm-hmm. And I think that's, that's, that's pretty good. Um, I think that a lot of people who are plant-based for some reason, they want to be called vegan. And I think sometimes vegans impose that label on people who are actually plant-based and they're quite happy to be plant-based. Celebrities come to mind. You know, they're quite happy to be regarded as plant-based. They talk about their plant-based diet all the time. And we, as vegans, sometimes go, oh, we've got another vegan, especially someone who's famous. So, you know, the movement is culpable too. You know, we, we could do with a bit more precision, I think. Hmm. Hmm. That, that's yeah, really interesting. I, yeah, I agree with that. I mean, you do get some people that are plant-based and become vegan. I mean, um, um, you know, th- there have been some of the um, the sports personalities. Um, that it's, who's, who's the the um, the racing driver um, who's plant-based? Um, I forget his name. The champion one, you know, Roger um, Lewis Hamilton. Lewis Hamilton. Um, started off adopting a plant-based diet um, for, I mean, strange for a racing driver. I think he said it for environmental reasons. Yeah. Um, but he's now posted an image of what happens. He's kind of gone from plant-based to being vegan in a sense, although kind of I do question the environmental side of what he does. So that can, you know, people can kind of start off plant-based and be vegan in the philosophical case, as he seems to have done. Good. So it's not to say that if you are plant-based or, you know, or, or you, you know, you want to stop eating animals because of the environmental impact, 
it's not that 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 can't turn you into a vegan eventually. And it's not to say that, um, you know, it might be that we need a big conveyor belt that in some cases takes people to like through environmental arguments and then they eventually end up becoming vegan. We're not dismissing that. It's just that, you know, there, there's no reason to call that vegan. And well, this um, is where education plays a role uh, because education is, is vital, as me and Money would agree when you're talking to the public, but education within a movement is also vital. And, you know, it's kind of, if you like, for um, well, those people who are a bit longer in the tooth, perhaps, hmm. to kind of try to make themselves available to kind of say to people, well, actually, you know, this, this is the case or this is what uh, used to be the issue and, you know, that, those kind of things. Um, you know, you can't, as it were, stop people making their own mistakes. But, um, you know, in, in that sense, you, you can't kind of guide them like a parent. But I think you can be there as a voice to actually say, well, you know, that's been covered, this has been sort of already. You know, those kind of issues can be dealt with by that kind of general, you know, we, we need a probably a better intergenerational mix, perhaps, or at least relationship. You know, my, I'm feeling frustrated about that because it seems to me that a lot of the newer vegans don't want to uh, listen to the, uh, the older ones. And in mm -hmm. fact, they're quite resentful of the points that we make. And it's not as though, I mean, obviously, the problem would be kind of, well, I've been vegan for so-and-so, so-and-so, you know, what do you know? I mean, that would be the wrong approach. But to actually dismiss, you know, you know the people who have kind of been there, got a t-shirt, that thing, that's also wrong. Yeah, mm. really is a problem. I, um, I think but one of the situations and, and um, the, the reasons for that, I think, is because because there's been um, such a big increase in veganism, or certainly people eating a, eating a, a plant-based diet, um, most of the people that are doing that now have only been doing so for a, for a couple of years. So that, like, with, with, you know, the, 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 most people who describe themselves as as, as vegan have, have, have only been have only been doing that like for a very short period of time. So they kind of they kind of pick up from what's around at the moment from like YouTube and, and stuff on social media and loads of them aren't, aren't at all aware of, of the, of the history of the movement because they interact mainly with, with one another and not with the, the, the more experienced people. And I think that's, that's kind of one of the reasons for it is because there's been this kind of rapid, such a, a rapid in, increase in certainly people are, are adopting a vegan diet. Hmm. Well, that's and, really and as you will know, um, Aaron, the, the danger for a social movement is when you do get a takeoff and you get a lot of people coming in, just that in itself is, a, is a, a threat to the core values. And that's exactly what's happened to the vegan movement in the last five years. Hmm. Let's talk through it. So you get like a massive influx of people coming in and now it's a lot less ideologically pure. And it becomes this like big church idea and everybody has new ideas about like what this is and they want to redefine it and they don't want to think about the uh, core values and then it just becomes a diffused kind of mess. So the idea. Yeah, I, I, always go, I always go back to another kind of Marxist example. I, mm -hmm. I find it, I would be flabbergasted if someone as it were joined the Marxist movement if there was such a thing and were to do that and then kind of go, well, I don't care what this old guy Marx said Marxism mm -hmm. to me is X, Y, and Z. And you would go, that, that's astonishing to, to do that. But that's also what's going on in the vegan movement. Yeah. And do you see, like, how do movements solve that problem? You, well, you try to, you know, um, you try to kind of um, get, get better, I suppose, at um, education within the movement, you know. And so uh, I suppose things like conferences would have a mix of, of New and the old and kind of but I think it really needs for people to be open to each other's position on that, and not to just to be too arrogant about it. Mm. Um, you know, in in the sense that you know, I'm I'm faced with assertions that I don't know what I'm talking about, uh, but they, as a vegan of four years, knows more about it than, than I do, especially the history. And as you said about the Bashir thing. You know, veganism has always been X, Y, and Z. And you go, well, actually, that's not true. And they go, yes, it is. You know, they, they don't go, well, you know, what's what's the evidence? You know, and when you present the evidence, 
you will often get blocks on social media because they don't want their supporters to see it. Hmm. Yeah, you know, ever since I started quoting you, I, I got people been telling me I don't know what I'm talking about either. <laughs> All right, it's, it's catchy, isn't it? Eh? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's infectious. There's two of you that don't know what you're talking about, and probably I don't know either. Uh, yeah, none of us know anything. We're like Socrates. We just we know that we don't know. No, but we, you know, yeah. you, you know stuff. Um, no, that that's interesting. And and maybe there's a couple of directions we can go in. Like I think one direction we should go in is the direction of like how we do vegan outreach and how we actually should go about educating people. But before we do that, I just want to see if if the three of us would agree on a definition of of veganism that seems like it's respectful of the founders. Suppose we say something like this, a veganish a definition of veganism has to commit us to um, three things. You are committed to anti-speciesism, you're committed to fighting for animal liberation, and you, you don't eat or use animals. Um, does that defin, like, do those three points hit on like the things that you'd want in a definition of veganism? I'd want I'd want something included that uh, included some sort of duty of people to do what they can to be active in promoting veganism as well. Okay, because I think it's important. It's important that it spreads. It's important that people aren't just it's because it it shouldn't be about um, what we don't do because 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 really um, that's a neutral position. That isn't that isn't doing anything good because, you know, not consuming animal products, not oppressing animals is what we should be doing anyway. It's kind of like saying, well, aren't I great? I, you know, I didn't kill a child today or, or I, great? I didn't mug an old person. No, you're not great. You, you shouldn't be killing a child or mugging an old person anyway. And, and, and the kind of passive definition of veganism is kind of just not doing things that you shouldn't do anything anyway. And we, we need to do more than that. We need to kind of be, do active good. It should be about doing active good, which means going out there and, and spreading the vegan message. I see. Okay, so it's like we, we fight against speciesism. We fight for animal liberation. Yeah. And yeah, then there's whatever. a whole bunch of yeah, things. We've got to be careful do. here, though. Okay. Because, I mean, this is where me and Ronnie will probably diverge a little bit here. In the sense that, um, you know, just, um, you know, eating your vegan diet, to use that phrase, you know, eating your plant-based diet uh, three times a day, that is kind of in some ways taking action, you know, because it's about supply and demand. And also I've never known a silent vegan. So, um, I mean, I know there's supposed to be this mythological creature somewhere, but plus there are those jokes about, you know, you know there's a vegan in the room because they'll tell you something. <laughs> and so um, <laughs> you, you, you've got that situation where you think, well, okay, you know, what's, um, you know, if, if somebody said, well, you know, why are you eating that or why do you, feel this and what are your views on that most vegans will answer so they they are kind of like it's uh, we're campaigning i yeah. know i know there's you know different ways of looking at that but hmm. it, it i don't i don't think we can just say that there is such a thing i don't think there is such a thing as a passive vegan at least not a widespread thing what you see see how i look at it is that you know we need to achieve animal liberation as soon as possible you know we have fifty thousand animals being slaughtered every second that's just for the food industry we need to obtain animal liberation as much as possible so we need to get that message out there as much as possible and we need to encourage people to be getting that message out there as much as possible because it's only vegan so we'll spread the vegan message and so we have to do whatever we can to encourage as many vegans as possible to be as active as possible now for different people that may mean different things for some people it might be I mean, today I was in the supermarket and I got some magazines and went somewhere where there were no uh, security cameras. And I put ve relevant vegan leaflets in a number of the magazines and then put them back on the shelf, a little thing like that. Um, you know, there are lots of people that, that, that could do that. That's just a little thing, leaving the, um, uh, a leaflet on a public transport. There's all oh. these things people can do all the time to promote veganism and we need to be encouraging people. We need animal liberation as, 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 as quickly as possible. We need to be doing whatever we can to encourage that. And if that, if that means getting people to think of veganism and think of themselves as vegans in a different way and in a more active way, then I think that's what we should be doing, what we should but, be encouraging. But Ronnie, do you, do you think there are a lot of vegans who won't do that? They won't put um, leaflets into, into books or they won't leave a couple of leaflets mm. on a train or a bus? Yeah, yeah, I think there are a lot of vegans that, that, that won't do it or won't think of it. 
and and we need to be encouraging them to, to do that do that little thing because if lots of them did it, it would make you know it, it could make a, a a a big difference you know posting leaflets through people's letterboxes it's like a really easy thing to do um and helping helping at events helping with stalls helping um with distributing leaflets in the street there's, oh, there's loads of things people can do we need to be encouraging people to do whatever they can now not everyone can can do the same thing people are constrained by different by work by family by um their own health sometimes um and not everyone can do the same but we should be trying to encourage um, all vegans to do as much as possible to spread the message yeah. because if we well, don't do that then animals then more animals will suffer and die let's take up that point for a second so I, like the way i'm seeing this question is we're trying to figure out who gets to count as being a vegan and i think that what we're trying to determine is like what level of activity is a necessary condition for counting as as being a vegan and um, I think a, a good challenge is something that you just brought up. So you talked about people who might not be able to go out into the streets. I read a story last night about a woman who was, uh, she was very, you know, committed to the cause of the Black Lives Matter protesters, but she, she, had, she, she, she had a disability. And the way that her disability worked is that she would have chronic um, pain and chronic fatigue. And there'd be periods of months where she wouldn't be able to get out of bed. So she was lying there in her bed thinking about what it means to be an activist. And she thought about like Hannah Arendt's definition, where like Arendt thought that you had to be doing you know, public actions where you're engaging in the, in the public sphere. But I think Hannah Arendt's definition doesn't allow for people like her to count as being an activist because during those periods, you really can't get out of bed. So what I wonder is, is there, do we want to be able to count her as a vegan as well? And if we do, what does that mean for the level of activity that's a necessary condition for being a vegan? Well, we might need to differentiate between vegan and activist there, though. Okay. Uh, and um, we've got to be careful here. We don't slip into ableism. Right. Because, uh, you know, um, having a problem might not be a physical one. Or it could be, it could be combined with, you know, other issues which make it difficult. You know, people might be chronically shy. Uh, as well as you know, physically um, differently able. You know. So I think we've got to be careful here, you know. And perhaps what we need to do really is, um, when when people are able to do what they're able to do, that should be praised rather than go, well, that's not really activism or that's not really veganism. That you know. So I think that um, we should be on that one. I think we should be very, very inclusive if we can. That makes sense. I yeah, I agree. I mean, what we've got to remember is that the definition of vegans includes the words as far as is possible and um, um, and practicable. You see, and what's possible and practicable for one person um, isn't the same as for another person. And so somebody that's got, um, you know, health problems, whether those are psychological or, or physical, um, it, it's kind of what you adopt as, um, as your philosophy, that you you kind of believe a certain thing. If you kind of believe that veganism should include an active element and you do your best to to do that, even if what you can do is in, in reality very little, then you're, 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 you're still within that definition because you're doing what's um, possible and, and practicable. Well, I think, I think the solution then is to talk about the word uh, advocate, that it, when, when you become a vegan from, say, a plant-based person, you become an advocate for other animals. You become an advocate for veganism. Mm. I think that would solve that issue probably. Good, and I think as long as we have like like some practicable and practical const- like qualification on on advocacy, is is that fair? Just so that we can include people who aren't able to get out of out of bed. Those people could still help spread spread the message as long as as long as people are doing their best. Okay. According to their own, you know, um, as, and, and as long as they they understand that uh, kind of that's what it means to be vegan, then then yeah, you know, they'd be be included w- w- within that. I mean, the, the problem is is that you know so many people aren't aren't doing that, and um, I mean, you know, as a species, you know, uh, we are responsible for the horrific oppression of other animals. You know, the, the human species, are, you know 
Nazis of the earth. You know, we we occupy, we destroy, we lay waste, we, you know, um, do the most horrific things for other animals. That, I think as members of that species, we, we do have a duty to put that right, mm -hmm. to put right the crimes that our species has committed. And we need to accept that that, that is a duty upon us to do that. And, and that falls on, on everyone's shoulders. And all right, yeah, it falls on the shoulders of non-vegans as well, but non-vegans aren't, aren't going to realise that until they yeah. become vegan. Yeah, so just to put sort of a bow on this, it seems like what we're saying is that um, a vegan is somebody who is an advocate against speciesism and an advocate for animal liberation. What that's going to mean is going to differ based on your, your context and, and what, mm. what you're able to do. Um, yeah. But does, does that seem like it's a fair... Does that definition give us enough content that we're able to pick out all and only vegans? I don't know. I mean, I think, I think there's a, a complexity here. For example, there is another side of the coin that we've just been talking about, uh, and that is some of the people who are most active. Um, the question is, are they being effective as educators? You know, because just being active doesn't necessarily mean that your job is done either. So, you know, we can criticize people who are so-called passive and don't do anything. And some of the people who are doing the most, well, where is that material going? Let's try and marry a couple of things together. For example, you know, if you're, if you're doing a save thing every couple of weeks, you know, what's wrong then with, um, you know, putting all those pictures and some description on leaflets and then putting them through people's doors in your local mm -hmm. area? See, what I see is a lot of people doing a lot of activist stuff. And, and now we've got jet set activists going around the world doing all this. And they seem to be mainly sharing it amongst themselves mm. on social media. They don't seem to be very savvy about getting the mass media. And I, I, I mean, I, you know, we can talk forever about the problems of the mass media. But, you know, the seductive part of the mass media for social media is the mass part of it, right? But so there is a kind of problem there. But, you know, I see a lot of activists they're just do, doing it they, they're putting it out on social media they get a lot of likes within the vegan community i'm not quite sure if it's really getting very far out of that and so yeah. we, could, we could look at that as well yeah. mm. but to be clear mm. is, is the argument that they're not being good vegans or that they're not being vegans so I, I definitely agree that that's not effective maybe it's not good activism um but i don't know if that should be enough to say that they're no longer vegan yeah. Oh no, I wouldn't say. I wouldn't. No, no, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Go, I wouldn't go there. That was not really. I mean, I was talking about sure, sure, sure. because be an activist. Got mm. it. Okay. Yeah, Ronnie. It looks like you wanted to talk. Sorry. Yeah, I'm just saying that. Um, well, a couple of things. I mean, yeah, I, I think it's really important that we have an analysis of the type of actions that people do because obviously um, we all need to be as effective as we possibly can in in spreading the vegan message. And um, I think there are cases where people are putting a lot of energy and time and energy and, and money as well into things that, that, that aren't particular, particularly effective or, or not as effective as other things they, they might be putting those same things into. And it's important that we kind of do have a discussion about that because we need our movement to be as efficient as possible in terms of um, um, spreading the message. I mean, that said, I think that... Um, you do need to have a wide range of, of different activities and different types of activity appeal to different people. I mentioned earlier about the um, meet the victims, that that isn't something that I'd be particularly drawn to. I tend not to really be drawn to things that involve large numbers of people. I, I prefer to do things with, 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 with smaller m numbers in, in my own local area. But that doesn't mean I don't think those, those, those are good things if that's the kind of thing that people want to do. But I think with SAVE, I think, I mean, I've been um, a bit critical of, of the, the SAVE movement myself in the past for actually um, not not being where they need to be in terms of, of preventing what's happening to the animals. Because I think where you need to be really is not outside the slaughterhouse, but in the street educating people not to consume those products so the animals don't go to the slaughterhouse in the first place but the, when they're being driven in in the lorries it's rather too late <laughs> but if you if you can take footage of that and then use that to educate people yes i i i, I can understand that and if, if they're doing that then i can see that i can see the point of it yeah well, well, let's we, talk we about do that in oh, oh. Uh, we, uh, so we do that in dublin and um, i don't know where local came from. So we we do that in dublin in the sense that you know we, we're using images from the save 
thing we've got a, a little leaflet made made up from um, the recent meat addiction thing. So our thing is to kind of use the activism going, going on and then translate it into some form of education. Because that yeah. seems to be the kind of key. If, if, if that link is broken, it seems to me then to devalue the activism that first took place. Yes, I'd, I'd, I'd agree with that. And I think people, um, I, I think the problem is, is that, that, that people don't really analyse sufficiently what the effect of, of, of what they're doing is, is going to be. I think people go on how it makes them feel like on the emotional side of it like i'm outside an avatar and i'm able to touch a pig and i'm right there where the animals are going in and i hope i can give some comfort to the animals and i'm bearing witness to this and that makes me feel like i'm doing something and that i'm right there and so people are tending to do it more for how it makes them feel than for um than for what it actually really achieves that, that people aren't thinking enough about it people aren't analyzing it but i think this is that's a common that's a common problem with human beings as a whole isn't it that people don't think enough <laughs> about the cause and effect of, of, of what they're doing and so it's not surprising that that um that uh, affects um vegan campaigners as well yeah you know i i have a i mean i think we share a lot of similar critiques and i i Let's just do save for just a minute, and then I want to go to the meet the victims thing because I, there was a lot of really interesting discussion about that. Um, with save, one of the things that I think is actually a, a, a benefit is the thing that you're pointing to as being sort of a problem, where the if you've been to a, a vigil and you've you've seen the animals, you know, like in in the trucks, and you've seen them go in, and I've even been to slaughterhouses before where you can actually see the slaughter. And you go through that and you see somebody die who you've just interacted with. I think that changes you. And that makes you somebody who, when you're on the street having conversations with people about veganism, you're able to talk about it in a way where you're emotionally connected to the violence where you, you, you just wouldn't be if you hadn't done that. So I think that well, there's I, an I argument. I strongly agree with that. I strongly yeah. agree with that. In fact, in the 80s, there was a group called the NOW, the Northern Animal Liberation League, and they specialize in taking large groups of people into units. And one of the reasons uh, was so they could witness the thing themselves. I mean, this was before the days of the internet. Uh, and, you know, even films were a few and far between those days. But once you've been in there and you smelt the place and you felt it, the heat of, of, of say, a battery unit, for example, um, you know, the kind of, uh, the horrible kind of uh, cleanness of the laboratory you know, you, you, can, you kind of felt it became very visceral. And after that, it wouldn't matter what a vivisector said or what a farmer said. You've kind of been there. Again, you've got the kind of T-shirt. It does give you that resolve. The other side of that coin, though, I think, Aaron, is the fact that if you're going to these kind of things, especially with the same thing, there's obviously the problem with the name itself, right? Yeah. So if you're going to that over and over, there's a chance of burnout there. You could actually damage yourself. And I think there is some evidence that that's been the case. A lot of people um, have said, well, you know, I used to go, but I couldn't go anymore. And they were very upset by the fact that they couldn't save anyone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that's powerful. I've known so many save organizers in particular who've been burned out. Um, they, they burn out fast. I, I, I think, I mean, and there's some, some who don't. And I think that, that like, one thing that people talk about a lot is self-care and people are trying to work on that. I, I see a lot of save activists being very proactive in that. Um, mm -hmm. But I have known quite a few who have burned out for exactly that particular um, reason. And I also want to add that. I, ironically, there was, a, there was a similarity what was going on um, with the ALF when, when the ALF were running out of homes hmm. and there was a switch to economic sabotage. It was very distressing to go into a unit of 20, 30, 40,000 individuals and you had homes for 53 of them. And yeah. then it's a question of which ones, you know, you, you ended up being a bit godlike there. And I think that wasn't psychologically great for the activists then. But at least they were actually liberating individuals there rather than mm. just letting them all go in. You know, and I think, I think that uh, in a safe movement in particular, we really have to be careful about what the effect is of the activists that they encourage to go and bear witness. I mean, I actually don't like the phrase bear witness. I think right. it no, feeds into the narrative that uh, mm. uh, veganism is religion for start. Yeah. 
And I wonder, have, have either of you ever like sort of counseled or, or helped ALF activists who have gone through this burnout and who have really struggled and, and suffered as a result of the experiences that you just described? Um, I think, yeah, I think I, I did to some extent. Um, but really, it's just a question of trying to have a, 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 have a chat and, you know, have, you know, again, before social media, people would actually have to meet face to face and go, oh, I'm having a hard time. What about this? What about that? And again, you kind of have to, you know, we, we all end up being utilitarian in the end and we all try and do what's best in difficult circumstances, you know, or you try and do, you know, the best of a bad job sometimes, you know. So th there is always that um, stress, you know, and there is always that danger that you're putting people in harm even when they're doing good because of the nature of what you do. Yeah. What about you, Ronnie? Have you helped um, activists? Um, these? On, on a one-to-one -one basis in, in, in terms of being friends with those people, yes. I mean, I've, I've kind of been on raids with people where, um, yes, where we weren't able to, to rescue all the animals, of course, because you, you can't do that, or where people saw some you know, horrific sights and afterwards were upset. And, um, and normally it wouldn't just be me. It would be kind of, you know, a, a group of people and, and there'd be a number of people in the group would be, helping the the ones that were particularly upset by that so yes that kind of did happen not not in a very formal way but in a kind of way in be in, in, in being friends with with the people that you were trying to help yeah yeah that that's that's fascinating the, um wow i guess like that's one aspect of the alf that i've never really talked to anybody about or, or really heard much about sort of the um the self-care that needs to go on and just sort of the, the collaboration and helping people through these really difficult uh, situation. It, it, it applies to lots of different ones, though. So, uh, uh, you know, and, and it apply, applies to unsaboteurs. You mm -hmm. know, if you if you see a pack in full cry and you can't do anything about it, and then you see them. I mean, I, I've seen foxes being ripped apart right in front of me, really? and it's very difficult because you're there to stop that, and you weren't able to. Yeah. You know, so there, there is, you know, there is a, a danger. All those kind of things. You know, and uh, I mean, I went, I went on sab once, and we killed, we killed, we killed a squirrel on the way. Mm -hmm. the car. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, that kind of does um, does happen, and um, I think one of the areas where it happens is where, where people are fighting the badger cull because, of course, they're out late at night driving around country lanes, and I think that's that's happened to them, and it has been has been very upsetting because they think, well, what was the point of it? We kind of went out to try and save a badger, and we ran over a rabbit or whatever. And so, you know, there is a there is a difficulty with that, but of course, in the in the ALF, going back to that. Um, be because we tended to operate in small groups, you, you, were, you were really very close with the people that you, you work with. So mm -hmm. it, it, that helped in terms of dealing with any um, anguish those people felt um, from seeing animals in distress or whatever. That you were already this close unit that, and, and were, you were kind of helping one another anyway. Yeah. I, it, I mean, so it seems like we need to have the right balance. You need to see enough that you're able to speak about things very passionately and have this intimate emotional connection to it. But you don't want to do so much that you just sort of destroy your ability to, to function. How do you navigate that and find the right balance? You mean as an, as an individual? I, I guess you could either at the individual level or at the, the group level. Like you could say like, how do I as an activist do it? Or if I'm running a Save Movement chapter, how should I do that as, as a leader? Um, I mean, I personally wouldn't know, know about save. It's, it's, sure. it's not, not so. We could say but, ALF, like as an ALF um, leader. Uh, well, I kind of think that's that's kind of what we what we did anyway, because of the closeness we had to the other people. In you know, it, it, it was always quite a small group of people that knew each other very well, and you had to know the other people really well to be able to operate effectively. And because you were you were kind of close friends, that that sort of happened automatically where you'd 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 help you'd help the other people. It would that would just arise from the you know the relationship that you, that you're in with them of of um, friendship and co uh, camaraderie really. Um, I mean, how I do it personally is I I, I don't go there. I mm. I won't I won't look at um, things with horrific images. I I won't watch Earthlings. I won't watch Land of Hope and Glory and these films. I don't I don't want to see them. Um, I know what goes on. I campaign against it and try to educate 
uh, other people. There's no need for me to um, have those images going into my head. There's no need for me to see it I, on, on social media. I don't I don't look down the um, newsfeed. I don't look down the newsfeed because otherwise I might see things like that. I don't I, I, I don't want to. But what I want to focus on is educating people um, to go vegan so those things don't happen. I already know about those things. I don't need to constantly remind myself and constantly traumatize myself through that. And I think this is a problem that some people have. That they, that it's, it's almost like a masochism. You look at some people's profiles on Facebook and they're full up of, of like horrific images that most yeah. are, are, are hor horrific, terrible, traumatizing. Over and over again. They're over and over again. You think just things all that. Over doing and i think that, that that i think that can paralyze people i think that that can have the opposite effect to um encouraging those people to be to be activists because i yeah, think well, that, going back to the point i made ronnie this is interesting yeah. because i i've heard that a lot what a lot of people do is they've got a lot of non-vegans on oh. their uh, on on their facebook and everything the non-vegans turn off the notifications and they very rarely go go back to, to that in, in the mm. sense that they think they're going to be um, confronted with that kind of thing anyway. And, and in, until somebody said, mm. oh, it's my birthday or something, then they'll interact on that level. Mm. And then again, you've got, you've got vegans who are talking to vegans because they've almost like filtered everybody else out by yes. posting this horrible stuff over and over again. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's the difficulty. Um, and I think you've got to strike a balance, you know. Uh, I mean, we, we kind of did this in um, because... Um, some years ago, I was involved in a campaign against the greyhound racing industry, and we used imagery in our campaigning. But we we were careful never to use the most horrific images. We used poignant images with, that would pull up people's heartstrings, but we didn't use the most horrific images because we wanted to strike strike the right balance of making people um, of moving people, but not making people look away. And I think it's kind of the same with um, with animal slaughter that that's you kind of have to if you're going to post images to look to post that sort of image um that won't put people off but will still have it have an effect on them there's also there's also a danger of distortion as well i think in the sense that um for example, i'll give an example that i know about um there's often the same image of say um greyhounds or other dogs being boiled alive in china and they've mm. been used for you know, the last 10, 12 years. Mm. And it's often, um, then the kind of narrative that goes with it is, is that this is widespread. Where the yeah. research is that most Chinese people have never tasted um, dog oh, flesh. You know, and also, also, you know, a lot of them that did, it ended up by mistake. And it also silences and erases and in invisibilizes all the, all the, vegan activists that are in China as well. Mm. So you end up with getting a lot of people making racist comments. Yes. Oh, you know, nuke China and all this kind of stuff. And so yeah. Yeah. All, all of that construction is totally <laughs> wrong on many, you know, it's yeah. totally unreflexive on yeah. lots of levels. Yeah. Uh, um, I mean, that's always been a problem about all those, it's all the nasty foreigners that do it and, and not us kind British people that... Yeah. <laughs> You know, and, and like if you kind of do a real analysis of like if you're going to do an analysis of um, which countries that is, is that somebody did this once. I remember and I think it was on an email group that we were both involved in some while ago before the before social media really took off. That there was a guy in the United States said, right, I'm going to do this kind of analysis and try to find out which is really the cruelest country in the world. And he, he did something like per head of population, how many animals um, were killed. I think that's how he based it on. And funny enough, the number one country in the world um, that he re that he said was the cruelest, according to the, the way he'd um, he worked it out, was actually China. But it was nothing to do with dogs and cats. It was to do with aqu uh, uh, aquaculture. It was to do with the vast number of small fish that they breed to eat. Nothing to do with dogs and cats. It was to do with little fish, and that's why China was the, you know, the number one country, I suppose, for consumption of animals. I think the USA was the second, hmm. maybe to do with the poultry industry or something like that. But that was, you know, that was kind of. But it was nothing to do with what people normally think of as 
causing China to be a cruel country. It's nothing to do with dogs and cats. Yeah, that, that's interesting. And just so that we're like, I, I want to, um, I want to try to point us to like some practical advice. Imagine that you're talking to a young activist and they come to you and, and they say, you know, I've, I've read Ray and I've read Watson. Like I want to become a vegan activist. I, and they I ask wish, you, Aaron, I wish. You wish, yeah. So this yeah, is I wish sort of a thought experiment. This is <laughs> as realistic as the desert island that vegans are often told about and they have to, yeah. yeah. Right. But, but I think that like, there's something like it that happens a lot where young activists come to me for advice sometimes. I'm, I'm sure that, um, you know, if you're in universities, young activists can come and talk to you. Suppose they're asking you, like, should I expose myself to the horrific stuff? Like, should I go with the hunt saboteurs and, and watch, you know, maybe I'll be exposed to the things that you've seen where the fox are ripped apart right in front of you. Should I go with the save movement and watch animals being slaughtered? How much of that should I expose myself to if I want to become the best activist I can be? Um, what would you tell them? I think it depends on their personality. Yeah. And it depends on what they're capable of and also what they want to do. I certainly don't think that people should shame people for not wanting to see those things. There is, there is this kind of almost like macho thing in the movement that you've almost like duty bound to watch earthlings every week. <laughs> um, you know, and if you haven't, you're not a real activist. Or something. And I, I find that really bizarre. You know, I mean, I've never watched earthlings all the way through. I've not seen Dominion. Um, I've not seen uh, Land of Hope and Glory all the way through. Uh, like Ronnie said, I don't, I don't need to. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of not necessary. And it doesn't, it doesn't kind of reduce what I would say about the rights violations going on. At, at all, you know, and um, you know, if, if I want the details, I'd probably return to the books rather than watch the videos. And again, I do think that the watching the videos kind of gets you stirred up emotionally. Now, some people might need that, and some people claim that, well, you know, that's motivated me to, to do more, and other people are going to be turned off from it or burnt out from it. So it's really going to have to be down to the individual and their personality. Hmm. That, that's great advice. So it's like, you know, see what you think you need. What what sort of an act, what sort of a person? Yeah, suck, it, suck it and see. You know, try try some some of it, but you know, don't feel obliged to have to do it. That, yeah. That 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 bit wouldn't wouldn't be correct advice. Mm. You know, and I do I do see that in the movement. I don't know if you've seen that, funny, but I I certainly have. You know, kind of all, you know, if you're not watching this, then you know you're not a real vegan or something. Yeah. I, I think that what we need to do in the movement is is build a structure of um, active local groups, of um, local vegan outreach groups um, uh, that are in every town, every city, and every suburb of every city. That's what we need to be trying to do because that is the way to, to reach the maximum number of people at grassroots level. And if somebody came to me and said, how can I, I want to do something to um, promote veganism? I'd say, well, look, um, get involved in your local group if you've got a local group. Um, and uh, if, if they're an active group, then become active with them. Uh, if, you, if, if they're a non-active group, then try to get them active. You'll probably find there's lots of vegan groups around, um, certainly in... Uh, I think certainly in Britain, certainly in the UK, that don't do really do any activism. They just organise organise occasional social events and post all on their Facebook group about what the latest vegan product they've discovered is, and you know stuff like that. And um, I'd like to see all those groups become become active in in out on the streets promoting veganism. Um, some will, some won't. Probably if if the right people were involved. Or if there's not um, an active group, form a group. Because the thing is, it's not, it's not just activists we need. There's something we need that's more important than activists, and that's organisers. You could have 100 people that want to be active. If no one organises anything, those people won't do anything. So the actual, what we need more than anything is organisers, and we need organisers in local areas to organise local outreach groups. And that's what I'd say to people. I'd say, I'd say to them, look, um, if, if there's no group in your area, then, then organize one. And, and I, you know, give them a, some tips and information about kind of how, how to do that. Because it can be something, it can be something really simple. It's, it's not necessarily a complicated thing um, to, to, to do that. And I think that's really important. I think we kind of need to 
have the structure to spread the vegan message. And I don't think we've got a very good structure at the moment, like, like kind of in, um, uh, in the UK, most, most, um, vegan outreach actions take, take place in the center of big cities. Um, stuff like the Cuba truth and people do earthlings experience and other things. It's, it's mostly in the center of big cities. Um, in the county where I live, we've got a very active um, vegan outreach group in my area, but um, the other towns, about seven or eight other towns, and most of them have got nothing. Most of them, uh, in most of them, nothing goes on. There are vegans there, but they, you know, they're not they're not out there on the streets doing things. And I think it's really important that we change that situation. We do what we can to encourage th- people to organise things locally. That's powerful. Um, I, do, I really love this. I think that we're, we're talking about a pretty important message where one of them is the idea that you don't need to keep re-traumatizing yourself. And there really is trauma involved in, in some of the, the, the messages. And there's, there's a kind of like, you know, toxic masculine masochism that's involved sometimes in saying, yeah, you have to watch Earthlings every week. Um, and another thing is to just shift towards the more practical question, which is to say, you know, if you want to be... Uh, you want to get more involved in, in activism, um, you can start organizing where you are. You don't need to move mm-hmm. to the center of London. You, you could be out yeah. and you just get your, your friends together and you go out and have conversations with people. Mm-hmm. You can yeah. do even a small town. You can, you could, you don't need a lot of people too. A, a couple of people could set up a stall in the street and, you know, give out vegan information um, or even just go around and put some flyers through, people's letterboxes or hand them out in the street you know even even a, a very small you don't need like people tend to want to do things in mass numbers and i suppose that once again is kind of a, a human trait but you don't need to do that you can do things with really small numbers of people and in in in, in some towns towns to start off with that's all you'll have there'll only be a couple of people but you mm-hmm. can still do stuff you still do you can still do stuff with small numbers yeah and do either so one thing that I think intimidates a lot of activists is that they don't know how to talk to people. Um, they they're very good at going on. I mean, you know, pe- I think people right now are very well trained in how to have um, fights on Facebook, and mm. like they're good, they're they're well equipped for that. But to actually sit down with somebody in person and talk to them is kind of, um, you know, intimidating. And I don't think they always have good technique. So what I wonder is, do you have tips for how to have better conversations about veganism when you're out there on the streets talking to people? Um, yeah, I, I've, got, I've got several. Um, the, 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 general, the general thing is that, you know, we are social animals and we do communicate through symbolic language. And, um, you know, it, it doesn't take too much to be able to kind of chat to someone. Uh, and you don't necessarily have to follow a script like some activists nowadays seem to think you have to do. Um, I tend to, you know, I I always start a conversation off by being positive. For example, um, I don't I don't like the idea of when people come up and go, well, what's all this about? That you go through a, a list of things that you don't eat. And, and I've seen a lot of vegans do that. Well, you know, we don't eat this, we don't eat that, we don't eat, eat the other. And I tend to say, well, you know, veganism is a, a philosophy. It's about nonviolence and justice. You know, it sees itself as part of the peace movement. And once you start a, a conversation off on that footing, it's much better than all the negative stuff. And even when the people there try to force it back into negative, like, oh, well, you're the people who can't eat this and can't eat that. I always say, well, actually, I could eat that. You know, I know how to chew. It's just that I won't eat that. And so you bring it back to the ethics. So there's a kind of you know, experience that you get from trial and error. But, mm. you know, I think it's just a question of, of talking to people. And of course, when you are talking to people, it's a question of keeping calm. And how many times have we seen on, on um, social media, Earthling Ed gets loads of praise because he remains calm. He doesn't lose his temper. Well, what's the point of losing your temper with somebody mm. you're talking to? Mm. You know, if you want to talk to them, it's not as though people are going to say things that you're not aware of. Usually, people come out with the usual stuff that you've heard a million times. Yeah. And then what you've got to do is you've got to act then as an educator. That you know They might be saying, oh, well, what about plants? But for them, it's the first time. For us, it's the millionth time. And you don't mm. go, oh, God, here we go. You, know, mm. you, you, you don't be exasperated with people. You just go, 
well, let, let, let's go through that. And you go through the, the, the points, you know, mm. and it, it's not that you, you can kind of gain the, the outreach kind of skills, I think, fairly kind of quickly. And again, through trial and error. And I think you've got to kind of, in a way, put yourself through that kind of discomfort of making a few mistakes. But even mm. all the, you know, the YouTube superstars say that they did that at, at the beginning. It's just what's going to happen, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. I love that. And, you know, there's, um, so I trained as a violinist before I got into philosophy. And one of the things I was really interested in was uh, teaching very young children. So I studied in the Suzuki method. And there's one Suzuki violin teacher who, like, she was asked, um, how do you teach the same piece again and again and again? And she said, well, I don't teach pieces. I teach children. And as like a vegan conversation person, it's not that, oh, I'm going through, like, how do you deal with this argument again and again and again? Um, but I, I, one thing I hear you saying is like, it, it's, this is their first time doing it. Their first time having the opportunity yeah. to work through, you know, plants feel pain or, or whatever it is they, they bring up. And Sorry. if you view it as like, you're able to have this really powerful human connection with somebody else, it's this wonderful gift you're giving them and they're giving you a gift back. And it's like an experience that you can share with each other. So it's like, well, there's a, another very important aspect to this as well, Aaron, which is whether you're on the street or whether you're on social media, Mm -hmm. you, you can think about the audience. So you might be getting nowhere with a particular person, but the pe there are people reading, or when you're on the street, there are people listening and watching the conversation. Mm -hmm. If you're the one who's being rational and calm, and they're the one being unreasonable and silly or wh whatever, and saying ridiculous things, you know, cutting you off and let you um, finish the sentence, that kind of thing, then the audience go, well, who was, who was the most reasonable of that conversation? The vegan. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. And the same even on social media, you know, kind of somebody swearing at you and everything. You, you keep calm and you try to be responsive and you try to apologize if you make a mistake and this kind of stuff. And again, the audience is going, well, you know, who was the most reasonable in that conversation? Mm -hmm. So I think, I think the audience, there's some people go, oh, you're wasting your time with that person. And I, and I say, well, I'm not doing it for that person. I'm doing it for everybody else who's around. Yeah. Yeah. Love that. And, and, and Ronnie, uh, over to you. What, what do you think? Oh, I mean, I agree with what uh, Roger just said. Absolutely. That's really important. But in terms of um, educating other vegans to do outreach, um, I think one of the best ways is just have them come with you. Like if uh, uh, you're an experienced um, campaigner and you're, you're doing a street stall, um, so, uh, say to other people, don't, don't worry um don't worry about coming along if you've never done it before because there's going to be experienced people there to lend you a hand and to show you how you're not going to be thrown in at the deep end of having to talk to immediately talk to people you can kind of listen to what's being said and, and in, in, our, in our local group that's actually what happened we've had people who were very nervous that have come along and they've listened to it for a while to how, how people are handling conversations and then they've got involved and 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 eventually they've been com confident enough to just do it themselves on their own and that's it's, it's just you know teaching people through their involvement in you know in, a, in actual events and encouraging them to come along um by um making them feel safe that they're not going to be thrown in at the deep end yeah i, I think that's a very very important point that, that i just made there and in fact um when I was back in Liverpool, we used to do that. When we were, used to be um, invited into, into the mass media, radio and TV, we would take um, some people with us just to observe. They, they weren't going to take part because in those days in particular, it's a bit different now, but in those days, people had never been into a radio studio. You've got all the mics and computers and everything. And a TV studio in particular, you know, is, is pretty kind of intimidating. As, as Ronnie will say, you know, you, you've got a nice looking kind mm -hmm. of couch in the middle. <laughs> but, you know, it's in the middle of, of, a, of a weird kind of place where it's all dark around and then there's mm. these bright lights focused on, on the people and all these cameras whizzing around everywhere. So, you know, you can do that. And, and I think the important part of all that is the fact that it's more movement friendly to do that because you're being inclusive, you're sh skill sharing, and you're, you're trying to, you know, encourage the kind of next people to do it. But also it means that, well, if you can do it now, you go do it elsewhere. You know, there was a controversy about hmm, months ago, I think, involving Joey Carbstrong, mm. who made the terrible mistake of going on British media to talk about Fox something, and he didn't know anything about it. Mm. And what we would have done in, in our day, because in our day, 
Well, speaking for myself, I never thought, I mean, I, this is silly of me, but I never thought of making myself a millionaire or becoming rich through the movement. You know, <laughs> I, 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 ne I never thought of it. You know, what was I thinking, I think? And it just never crossed my mind that I could actually make uh, myself rich or well-known or famous or wh whatever uh, through the movement. I, I didn't see the movement as a vehicle. What, what would happen in our day is that, you know, the, the, the Jory Carbstrong person, the person contacted by the media because they just happened to have that name in the book, but they go, well, actually, there's somebody who can, who can be better than, than me on this. And they would pass it on. But yeah. of course, he wouldn't do that, you know. And Carbstrong likes to film himself being interviewed. And you could see on this one, you could hear the interviewer's question. And you could see him searching around for the answer because he just didn't know. Mm. And so then the English staff said, well, why didn't you pass it on to us? That's what would have happened in our day. Mm. Again, yeah. it was a bit more sharing. It wasn't about, oh, you know, that's going to take away from my YouTube. That wasn't even a, a consider consideration in our day. Mm. Yeah, no, that's that's powerful. And, and one thing I, I just want to throw in here so that we don't forget it, like, um, both of you have highlighted the importance of taking along people who are less experienced and sort of like developing them. And most of the time when Paul Bashir has come up today, it's been in the, in, you know, in terms of like, like critical things, but that's one thing that I think anonymous or the voiceless does really well, where if you are an activist and this is like your first, you're, you're sort of new to it, they have something built in where you can stand in the cube and just hold a laptop and watch people have conversations right in front of you. Um, and I, I think that a lot of activists have learned some really good techniques uh, that way. So that, I mean, I think that's one aspect of the cube that I think uh, they, they really get right. And it's, it's really a positive thing. And people who don't do cubes should find some way of incorporating that into their outreach so that there's space of people who are new to it to, to, to learn. Yeah, I think, I think I generally agree with that. There, there are some things about cubes which are, um, interesting, but also problematic. I mean, I, I've, um, I've, I've done a lot of the Earthlings thing rather than the, the cube. Okay. And um, interesting to me that a lot of people in Anonymous won't go to Earthlings for some reason, but uh, that's, that's hmm. another matter. Um, which is just a different mask, really, but anyway, there you go. Um, well, I think what, a lot of that I is like turf wars, right? Sorry? I think a lot of that is like sort of like, like a turf war where they don't want, they want to sort of control, they want to have the brand. I think it's to do with branding. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I I was told by an Irish activist that people like the uniform and they like to be told what to do, probably for the reason that they're not feeling that, that um, secure and mm. confident. And so they are kind of directed kind of what to do mm. uh, initially. And so obviously you can see the benefit of that. But also I think the uniform is part of, part of, part of it. I think people do get that. And, and again, there are psychological reasons why you can think about that. You know, it brings people together gives you a sense of unity and this kind of stuff. So these things are, are kind of powerful. You know, and there's yeah. a kind of social aspect to it. All of that you can see, you know. I've known people in cubes or in earthlings who um, they'll go, you know, use the, the opening line, you know, have you seen this type of thing before, this yeah. kind of stuff. But then they might spend 45 minutes talking to one person, you know, and missing lots of other people they could be interacting with. So mm -hmm. again, it, it's something you need to be reflexive of. And going back to what Ronnie was saying, something that you need to be constantly analyzing, you know, were we doing that right? You know, um, do we do that for too long? You know, what, how should we stand? I mean, I was, I was at one thing once when I almost got attacked by somebody. I was wearing a mask and mm. uh, somebody came up from the side and had a bit of a go at me. And I think they had a weapon. I'm not quite sure it was. Wow. But nobody, nobody in the outreach part even noticed. You know, mm. So again, you know, we, we, we so there, there are there are things, constant lessons to be learned, I suppose. But that's that applies for everything. Yeah, I mean, and, and there's so there's so. Um, yeah, I'm sorry that happened to you. We we had some. So there was a cube in in Madison, Wisconsin. It, it was it was me actually. Oh, you're. The <laughs> 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 wow. Yeah, you missed because you couldn't reach, eh, running. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we had this one woman and for some reason whenever she was in the cube at least one person would come up and try to hug her like during the cube of truth and this happened about three times so we eventually had somebody who was stationed near her who would just watch her and their job was to make sure that nobody would come up and hug this one activist and to this day i have no idea why she was like picked but um you know 
like so i think that cubes have to innovate and they have like and it's not just cubes it's any form of activism you need to have a marshal who's watching and like aware of anything and the second somebody's getting too close so they're going to be violent like you step in and you was, get in. was it men who were trying to hug this person um was primarily men yeah yeah well, i think patriarchy might have something to do with them you think what i think patriarchy might have something to do with it then oh i'm i'm, I'm sure it does yeah <laughs> um yeah so but yeah it's it's uh it's hard why why don't we so there's one other thing that i was hoping to talk to you all about and it's it's sort of the subject of popular representations of the animal liberation front um so right before this call started i sent i sent ronnie the video from from okja and it goes through like it's it's the umbrella scene right where they um you know they're, they're, there's police officers who are shooting darts and the alf has these like really bright umbrellas that open up and it's a really dramatic thing and john denver music is playing and it's really emotional and i was just sort of curious to sort of you know get get your thoughts on that and then uh roger i know you've actually seen the, the full movie okja i'd love to know like um what do they get right what do they not get right and um yeah so uh First of all, Ronnie, what did you think of that scene? Um, was that the sort of thing that you folks used to do? Or what are your thoughts? Um, no, not really. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think- Get, you, get your balaclava and your brolly out. Yeah. Yeah, get, yes, yeah, I don't think I ever carried a, a brolly on a, a raid and certainly didn't have um, darts um, fired at me although i did go on one raid where we had a shotgun fired oh. whether it was fired at us or whether it was fired to warn us i don't know we didn't hang about very long after it was fired um but that was uh but no i mean um very very different to to that film um but then that the film was made to um i suppose like a lot of movies they don't really stick to reality because the prime aim is to um get box office figures and entertain people so i wouldn't necessarily expect it to be realistic yeah and, and roger what do you think so like what do they get right what do they not get right about the alf oh boy well the, the, the alf bit was a bit bizarre and i i remember the vegans kind of praising it oh this is going to make uh, a lot of people think and everything and i was just focused on that alf thing which, which seemed to be totally sort of like a cartoon version of the, of the alf um for a start you know but there was a lot of, I mean, I, it's a long time since I've seen it, I only saw it once. But there was a lot of things which didn't, I mean, I didn't think the, the narrative stru structure just held together at all, in the sense that you had um, this giant, giant pig on top of a mountain, uh, part of this com um, competition. And these beings were potentially really va um, valuable. And then you've got them kind of rolling down and falling off mountains and everything potentially killing themselves or injuring themselves. And I think the worst bit that kind of struck me as just totally realistic was towards the end where I think the one pig won the contest and became massively uh, valuable. And then five minutes later, they were in the slaughterhouse, which didn't kind of work for me. Kind of like, you know, um, of, of all the, you know, it's like, the, you know, e even farmers know not to, send the feeding stuff as it were to houses of slaughter so it just didn't you know every everything about it was a bit odd to me and mm. you know i i found it difficult just to engage with it as a film and forget all the i, I think i was too much of an animal activist watching it to be honest i see well but so maybe you can point to a couple of things one thing i noticed that they got wrong was that the leader of the alf cell um would like he, he was, he beat up another member of his cell because he, because the other person mistranslated something in order to manipulate somebody. Um, and that's something that like, Ronnie, you never beat somebody up for a mistranslation, right? Uh, not for a mistranslation, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think I'd beat anyone up. I wasn't big enough to beat anyone up, I don't think. <laughs> no, I mean, no, that, I mean, that didn't happen. I mean, obviously, that there'd be, um, you'd always get um, disagreements uh, uh, between people in, in any organisation, but I can't remember ever, ever getting as far as um, uh, physical violence. No, no, that, yeah. that. That and that would have been happen. contrary to your principles. I mean, you, you folks were 
committed to nonviolence. Like, um, yes, yes, um, uh, and uh, no, it, no, 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 it didn't happen. No, yeah. it, that's uh, that's not a realistic portrayal of what the NF did. Yeah. I th- so, and one other question. I don't know if um, like how how well we can do at answering this, but what I was wondering when I saw it was whether this was a good thing or or a bad thing that they're being portrayed in this way because it's sort of a mixed bag like on the one hand the alf were the action heroes and th- there's this really emotion i mean the the scene that I, I sent you was really quite emotional like it's like here's these heroes coming in to save this giant genetically modified pig from being captured by people who want to do horrible things to her and um to see the ALF in that light, where they're the heroes fighting for justice and fi- fighting for the interests and the rights of, of animals, is is kind of a cool message to have in a in a fairly mainstream film. I mean, it was like a Netflix, um, so that, that's pretty fairly mainstream. Um, on the other hand, there are quite a lot of misrepresentations. So what I wonder is, like, do you see uh, things like this as like a good thing? or a bad thing, or maybe that's not a good question. I think it's so far removed from reality that I don't think anybody would really connect the two things. To okay. kind of, well, you know, this is a representation of activists, and then there's the ALF. I mean, I think if it presents itself as some kind of documentary, we, we, might, we might have a different kind of situation. And, and, and there has been real documentaries in which misrepresent the ALF too. Uh, and so I think we would, see them as much more of a problem in the sense that you, you know you're actually associating the real thing with something that looks real whereas here it, it was you know something that was a great you know act of liberation being portrayed by something that looked like a cartoon to me so i i was so disconnected from that 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 wasn't a worry for me that people are going to go oh this is the era I don't, I don't think people would do that all right yeah and, and i guess just to to um to to push on that a little bit, it it seems like I've never seen a popular movie paint the ALF as heroes. Like they don't even come up at all typically in movies. And I wonder whether that's enough just to say like, we're going to use this word ALF and we're going to have immensely like 12, positive 12 associations. Twelve monkeys where, where, uh, where, they, where they, they, they release, um, I think they release the inmates of the zoo, don't they? There, there is a TV series called Judge John Deed, okay. which was written by um, a friend of mine and probably Ronnie, uh, someone called mm. G.F. Newman, Gordon Newman. Mm. And mm. that was the most realistic um, thing that I've seen on TV, at least, uh, because Gordon used to write faction, so it was fiction based on fact. Okay. And, what was um, the name of that again? Uh, Judge John Deed. Judge John Deed, okay. Yeah, it was a BBC series. Um, starring Martin Shaw and Jenny Seagraves, I think that's the name. Mm. And um, I think Shaw was a vegetarian, and I think um, Jenny Seagraves may, may have been a vegan, I'm not quite sure. I know, I know that Gordon made up the entire crew, because he, he, he got to be not only the writer, but he got to be the producer and then director sometimes. And he made the crew um, eat plant-based, and the stories of them kind of at the end of the day, which, you know, from McDonald's and stuff, and that kind of thing. But uh, yeah, that's the most sympathetic uh, portrayal of the ALF that I've ever seen uh, okay. in, in that series. And then there's two episodes of it where the ALF feature. I love it. Got it. I'll, I'll check that out. Mm. Um, cool. Well, we've covered a whole lot. We've been talking for, I think, almost like an hour and 45 minutes. And I, wow. I, I'm really grateful to, to be able to have this conversation. Really, you know, thanks so much for, for your time. Um, is there anything else you want to add to you know to this conversation before we um, you know say goodbye to the, uh, the the viewers? I think in terms of of, um, of movies, mm-hmm. um, th- there are some really uh, interesting and exciting aspects of the ILF that could be made into a movie. I mean, you know, some of the raids that ha- occurred in the past. Mm would make a, a, a really good movie, you know, just sticking close to the, the, the truth of what happened. And it kind of does surprise me a little bit that that's never been done because it has been done in relation to other, to other movements, and, but it's never, it's never been done um, regarding the ALF. And yet, the, the, you know, there's the scope for like, a, you know, something, something really good there to be produced. 
So that is a bit surprising, but it's mm. kind of almost the same as there's a lacking in there's a lack lacking uh, as as well as the the, the movie side of it. There's also a, a lack of um, literature about the ANF as well. Mm. You know, very few books have been written that, that talk about you know the ANF and what the ANF did um, as well. So it's this this overall lack of um, historical. Um, coverage really so perhaps it's not surprising that the you know youngsters of today don't know much about what's happened in the past because there's very little there for them to refer to yeah I, i'm totally I'm, I, would, I would fine. see a movie yeah <laughs> so so who, who which hollywood superstar do you want to play you then ron go on tell us I, I don't really know much about them. Which, which one's the most rugged and handsome of them? That's that's what I'd be kind of looking for, really. I don't know. I I don't know much about the uh, who, who the movie stars are today. I know ones that existed thirty or forty years ago. Yeah, I, I think, think Sylvester I, Stallone is something for you. I think, Ronnie. Sylvester <laughs> <laughs> Stallone. <laughs> yeah, I could see that. I mean, there's so much drama. There. Imagine like movie starts. You're in the basement cafe in London in the summer of 1973. <laughs> punk rock like the, the, the ramones are playing so, and um you know i know there was some talk of there being a movie about barry horn um the guy the uh an activist who died on hunger strike okay. there was some talk about there being a movie about him starring joaquin is it joaquin phoenix was going to play barry horn yeah, in this joaquin, movie yeah. but i don't know what ever became of that but that would yeah. that could probably be made to be quite a um, you know a good, a good movie um, there was a film uh, about Jill Phipps that John Curtin uh, made, wasn't there, Ronnie? Really? I think I think there was, but I don't know. I I I don't think it was that widely shown. I think I saw it on YouTube or somewhere, but I don't think it was like a mass. You know, you know, there were there were any kind of mass screenings of it. Hmm. To be honest, I mean, I mean, in many ways, the, the best animal liberation movie I've ever seen is um, Avatar. Hmm. I really liked Avatar. I was cheering in in Avatar when the, the the horrible, nasty military bloke was killed, and everyone turned around and looked at him. <laughs> 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 I went, hey, go on, like that, and um, yeah, everyone turned around and looked at me. But I thought that I thought that was a good film, and that was like a kind of animal liberation film where the good, well, the, where the good animals won in the end over the nasty humans. And hmm. I thought that. And there's reference. There was a recent Star Wars movie, also. I don't remember which one it was, but they, uh, the the main characters, liberate a bunch of animals who are being used to like run races, and then they just run off into the the jungle. And that was sort of like I think they were they were trying to leave, and they they, they sort of like stopped to rescue the animals yeah. first. So we're getting like little hints of this in movies. Oh, but in in Star Trek, I think isn't everyone vegan in Star Trek, or certainly doesn't everyone eat a plant based diet? In the future, when people have yeah, begun, Spock, Spock, Spock is Spock. the actual character, but also the actor was, and Shatner was a vegetarian. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a you know, perhaps there's some hope in the future. You know, yeah. the, wasn't the you know the remake of Planet of the Apes featured the uh, Human Liberation Front? Okay. Ah. I'll that were liberating <laughs> liberate in humans from the apes. Is that what? Yes. Happened? <laughs> uh, the, yeah, <laughs> I've never watched any of the Planet of the Apes films. On the other, um, oh well, the, the 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 end of the first one is absolutely brilliant. It's really uh, spine chilling, but uh, I won't I won't give that away. Oh, spoil it for me because I might see it one day. Mm. Yeah, but I said there, there is big scope for a, a movie. Um, do you remember um, Operation Valentine? You probably remember that, yeah. Roger. Life now science in, in Essex, yeah. A, now that wasn't a normal type of ALF action because it was like a mass raid, which mm. which was more like the animal liberation leagues did. Um, but that would have made a because there was a car chase, or rather it was a, a minibus chase in, in involved in that with the police. <laughs> there were people coming out with animals and some of them getting arrested and all, all sorts. I mean, that would make a great movie, just just about that. Yeah, I mean, even um, I was part, part of this thing called um, the Battle 22. We, we went into one of these now things where we did take a lot of people into, um, you know, into, into a, a, one of these, uh, you know, uh, deep pit battle units. And, yeah. um, you know, a few, a, few, a few hens were liberated, even though the now didn't want that. And yes. one, one, of, one of the people ran off 
with um, some hens, uh, went home, got into a suit, and then came and visited the people who got arrested, including myself, <laughs> pretending to be a solicitor clerk, you know. And then yeah. it was a, a completely comical thing in terms of uh, the court case. Because we, we, we held a, um, a mock trial outside the, the court, which was filmed by the local TV. I was, <laughs> I was the judge. Uh, yeah. John Page was recipe as a chicken, and uh, I, I sentenced um, I sentenced the, the chicken to death because because uh, they'd uh, had the audacity to kind of you know uh, oh, I think my lights have gone. I'm just going to switch something on. Yeah, the lights went off. Uh, That's yeah. fascinating. You know, I think that there needs to be more mock trials in in the movement because it's such a powerful like yeah. form of activism. Was, I don't know whether that was the court case where there was somebody was it may have been John Page. They were had to go in front of the magistrates for a raid on a uh, chicken farm and they decided to wear a chicken. A yeah, that, that was the same thing and, and he, he would only squawk, he wouldn't talk to them. He would only was squawk. That, you know. was, was the one where the um, magistrate ordered him to remove the outfit and when he unzipped it he was naked underneath. <laughs> yeah, I can't remember that bit, but he did. He did do that. <laughs> no, he was I tell you what, I don't know if I've got time to, to, to well, say this. It's take, okay. it's take about three or four minutes, uh, Aaron. Would, would, you, would you like an anecdote from those days? I'd love one. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> yeah, there was um, when we when we there was twenty two of us in court. Um, some of the now people uh, defended themselves really well too, because they 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 make the kind of uh, points that you know your average kind of solicitor and barrister wouldn't do. There's a number of us who were defended by this guy called Reese Bourne, a, a radical lawyer based in Manchester. He's a Welsh guy, very sharp features. He had suits and, and a very elaborate kind of waistcoat and thing. And he had this kind of way of playing up to the gallery. And so there was a guy, what, what happened was the support demonstration outside, um, there were some people inside the support demonstration outside. Suddenly a group of farmers came and took their banners off them remove the sticks and start hitting people with them and everything, right? And so this became part of the central part of the trial. And Reese was was talking to one of the farmers. And he said, I, I can't really do the Welsh accent, so you'll have to forgive me this. So, sorry, sorry, Reese, if you right. ever see this. But he, he was kind of he said to this guy, um, did you have a stick? And the guy goes, No. And after each question, Reese would put his kind of thumbs in his waistcoat pocket and turn, turn to the public diary and go, oh, I see. And then um, he said, uh, your father, he had a stick, didn't he? And the guy goes, yeah. And he goes, oh, I see. And he goes, your uncle, he had a stick, didn't he? <laughs> and he goes, yeah. And he goes, oh, I see. And this is a lot slower than this. And then he said, um, now look, are you sure you didn't have a stick? And the guy goes, no, I had an iron bar. <laughs> and the, <laughs> the entire court just fell about. And there was a kind of Thatcherite right kind of, there was three magistrates. And on the end was a woman who looked just like Margaret Thatcher. And she just covered her face and just like put her head down. You know, kind of like you, you've really blown it, mate. <laughs> you oh, know, wow. and then at the end, in the summer, summing up, Reese was going. You know, the only people who admit to using violence were the farmers. You know, so it really swung the case. You know, anyway, that's, wow. my <laughs> that's fantastic. That, and that would be great. I mean, you could make a comedy movie. You could have a series. You could have a comedy movie. You're like, that's that one. Um, wow. Yeah, this is fantastic. I, mean, I, anybody... was once, I was once told to stand up in court by the magistrate, but I was already standing up. Yes. <laughs> 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 you, you could have warned me there, Ronnie. I had a mouth of water there. That's fantastic. <laughs> wow. Well, we, I'll tell you, what, we should all um, put our millions together that we've made from activism to financing mm. these movies. Yeah. I'll, right I'll, check, I'll check my Patreon. I think we're getting 23 euros a month, I think. Wow. Yeah, I'll have to call my financial advisor and see if I can, I can do that. Um, but no, this, is, this has been fantastic. And I, I, I uh, thank you so much for, for both coming. Um, and, and I just want to thank everybody who tuned in to watch this. You know, thanks so much for, for, for joining us. And if you have any questions, just leave them in the comments and we'll, uh, we'll get back to you. So thanks very much for, for uh, tuning in.
Thanks, Aaron. Welcome. Thanks, Aaron. It's great. Thanks, Thanks. General. <laughs> Take care, <laughs> man. Don't die. <laughs> <laughs>